and while that's um, I hope loading up, um, uh, first thing I would like to do is to uh, thank all of you on behalf of my university for all the fantastic work that you've been doing with your communities across the country for the last 10 or 11 months. Um, certainly in my own institution, we're full of admiration and awe and very humbled by the amazing work that you've done to keep the communities that we belong to safe. So a big thank you from, from me on that. Um, can everybody see the screen? Noel, can you just let me know if, the, if it's up there, is it? Yeah, looks yeah. like, uh, I, I definitely can, looks like other people right. can as well. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk, I've got about, is it about 20 minutes, Noel? 15 now, maybe? Yeah, we're, we're flexible, 15, okay. 20. Going to talk about these things. It's it's largely a a personal perspective on on how a particular type of university, which is a, a large urban university. So I acknowledge that this some of this won't won't resonate with you, um, and for some it, it may be more closer to to where where you're at, um, and just take you on a bit of a journey about how we've developed our relationship because um the first thing to say i think is that we weren't very good at this we still probably aren't that good at it but we're getting better and so i'm very interested today to be able to tell you about how we've approached it but i'm fully cognizant that i'm going to learn a lot from how you're working with your universities um, and i'm very interested to hear about that so i'll, I'll talk a little bit about ucl it's not a marketing job it's just to set the context um, because it controls a lot who we are and how we're set up controls a little bit about about what we where we're at and how we can progress so I, i'll talk a little bit about our setup and then in, in a little bit more detail about um how things stood i, I joined ucl about two years ago now back to almost exactly two years ago now so talk about how things what stood when i arrived um and then the uh, thinking that we took as to how we wanted the strategic intent to unfold, which I think is the bit um, where it will start getting kind of interesting to you, I hope. Um, so we'll talk you through what we wanted the, the relationship to look like and, and how we how we in, uh, interpreted that. Um, I'll go through some, some very sort of personal lessons that I, that we've learned uh, some of that will be will be uh, bleeding obvious to you and some of it might be might be interesting and then uh, Noel's just asked me to run through very quickly uh, a couple of, of case studies of, of of what it looks like on the ground and um, as I said I'm very very happy to talk offline about other things if if that is helpful to you um, so um, about UCL um, it, the first thing to say is UCL is, is is a large university in a large city. Uh, so we've got we've got nearly 50,000 students and and um, about about 9000 academics. Um, it's an institution that is based um, largely in, um, in in Camden in the Bloomsbury area of London, but of course we are opening a new campus in East London and that's important because it, it, it's allowing us to think about how you might build relationships with the community from scratch. We've been going in uh, Bloomsbury for uh, since 1826 or something like that so we're we're familiar with that area. Um, big international institutions so we we bring in um, over half our student bodies is is our, our international students uh, and a very large proportion of our staff are international students um so i tell you all of this because um it it doing anything in an org in a university that size in a strategic manner is, is actually quite difficult doing it in ucl is doubly difficult because it is virulently opposed to anything that has strategy in the title. It's a highly devolved institution. Its methodology is you know allow a thousand flowers to bloom. And um and, and in my view that has tremendous benefits in that that we are allowed to create and do things that I think 
few other institutions would 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 dare do. But at the other on the other hand, it is it is not always efficient. In fact, very often it is incredibly inefficient. So a big problem that we would have um, is duplication. So we don't know. I don't know what my colleagues on the other side of the campus are, are, are saying to Noel or talking to that. So we you know we are. It, it was inefficient. I think is the is the um, is the way I would I would express it. Um, if I can just move on to the next one, this just briefly is to introduce you to again. It's another element of the size aspect, but also to say that my uh, my personal interaction with Camden and around in, in, innovation, even mine, is limited to some extent. So this is just a schema of how the uh, part of UCL that I'm in, which is innovation and enterprise, which is a professional. Uh, service, so we're not an academic department. We sit aside from from that, and our job mainly is to support the application of UCL expertise and knowledge, know-how outside the university. Um, and um, we need to do that because uh, the academics um, are primarily charged with teaching and research. And so their engagement outside, although it is increasingly becoming important through a number of government initiatives, nevertheless, it is a uh, pinched, pinched time. And so uh, it, it requires academics to maintain relationships and relationships need to be managed and worked and invested in. And that's time that many of them don't have. So you have people like myself and most universities will have um, uh, people like myself whose job it is to sort of build those relationships, maintain those relationships. And we're we're uh, intermediaries between between those organizations that would work with the university and academics. We broker those uh, there is relationships. We introduce them. We try and hone them down as much as we can. Uh, and then very often we'll step out and let the academics and the the organization develop the relationship further. Um, my, my area, uh, we have about 47 people working on innovation and enterprise. I belong to the group in the um, the second box um, from the left uh, called Business Innovation Partnerships. And so my job is to build those those relationships. But you'll see looking along, if you can read there, that we'll, um, we have other ways of doing the same thing. So our entrepreneurship group, for example, is um, applying student knowledge and know-how in the form of startups and companies um, and we do that again with Camden um, I'm not able to talk much about that because as you can see in the purpose of showing you this slide is it's it's handled by a different part of the organization so even within an innovation and enterprise you can see that there's quite a lot of scope for getting tangled up and confused um, the two Boxes on the right hand side in red are subsidiary companies. UCLC is a consultancy group, so they will aim to commercialize um, research. And that's important that they are part of the family, but separate. Um, so my obligations as a partnership manager for the public sector is not to make money for the university and not to sell research, uh, which is an important distinction. Um, if we need to do that, we'll put that through UCLC and UCLB is another subsidiary that looks at uh, coming at it from the staff angle to to um, uh, commercialize intellectual property. So make companies that, that we own, the university owns um, uh, using using academic staff um, uh, IP. A little point here that sometimes might help you uh, if you're not aware students at a university own their IP, so their ideas belong to them. Uh, staff, their ideas belong to the university. So we tend to treat innovation coming through those different routes differently. Uh, so a student with a startup company, we have no we have no stake in that company. So what we're doing there is we're teaching them and training them and hoping that that company will be as successful as possible. Whereas an academic who wants to start up a company and do some innovation, we have a potential stake in that. Um, 
So how did things stand with Camden? I don't expect you to read this. It's never intended to, to read this diagram. I'll talk you through it, so don't worry. Um, when I came to UCL, the first thing I asked um, my team, I have a team of two people that I work with, is uh, what are we already doing with Camden? What, what is the relationship? And this is a graph uh, that emerged. The colored boxes at the top and the bottom are various bits of Camden. Um, uh, um, is that right? Or um, I can't read it. it. Either that or, or um, the boxes in the middle are various bits of Camden. The bit that I'm wanting you to pay attention to is the lines in between. Um, and all this is saying is that the um, the relationship was incredibly rich already. We're already doing huge amounts with our local authority, um, but that it, it was also very confusing. And the challenge I always set myself was how would I how would I explain if the provost asked me in the in the lift to say, well, what are we doing with Camden? How would I explain this in in a couple of minutes? And it would be it'd be very difficult. So I took the challenge to try and um, make this a little bit more strategic. But uh, I was very clear that I mustn't interfere with all of the very good work that has been built up for many, many years going along, because that would that would be really really bad. So we had a delicate balancing act. Um, and this is how we formed a strategy around it. Um, uh, I work in, I think, in pictures. So this is a tree house. Um, and so this is ideally what we kind of wanted the relationship, not just with Camden, but with all our external partners to be. The tree house is UCL and the trees uh, extending in all directions, as far as the eye can see, is uh, the, the context, London, for example. Um, and so the point being that there's all sorts of stuff going on uh, across London. It's very rich and, um, and you can say in, a, in any context, in any city, town or urban environment or re rural environment, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, we wanted to be sort of prominent sticking above that, something that you would see. Uh, and, and in particularly, what we wanted this particular image to be is what Georgia Gould would see, who's the leader of, of our council, when she looked out the window. Uh, she'd see UCL and she'd think, let's go to UCL. That's how we wanted the, the thing to, to be. And what we liked about this imagery was that um, the second picture there, underneath that treehouse, um, I have to be honest, it's not the same treehouse, but you get, you get the point. Um, underneath the treehouse is all this stuff still going on. Um, and that's the, the, the relationships, the partnerships, the academic connections that have already been made and that we don't want to jeopardise or interfere with. Um, and what's actually happening is the platform, the treehouse, is sitting on top of that. And if I can be poetical, it's drawing its its strength, if you like, from that. But it's not changing the direction in 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 in, 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 in any particular way. But when it exists and is created, it rises above all of that and becomes a prominent landmark that people can see. So, in a in in a kind of word, what we wanted to be is visible so that people could see us and in particular our local authority could see us. Um, I'll come on to the challenges a bit in a minute, but we also didn't want to constrain what was going on amongst our, our uh, existing relationships and partnerships. And a further aspect to the this, this kind of approach, this treehouse, what we ended up calling it is an engagement platform approach is that they are flexible. You don't have, you can build a, a tree house of any shape or size, depending on who it is that you want to see it. Um, and so we'll come on and talk about this in a little bit more, but for our local authority, the platform um, seemed to be best described by um, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, where if you change the lens and you're the mayor of London, we have a mayor uh, um, the 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 approach would be different. They're not really 
the MOU didn't seem the right way approach. And I don't think that the local, the regional authority would have wanted to go down that approach. So we've what we call the teacher's pet is the platform where we are sticking our hands up and trying to address issues off our own bat that we know the regional authority really, really cares about. And so we work through the, the mayoral strategies uh, to do that. Um, the question mark under three is merely to indicate that, th that this could go on forever. There's, there's different types of platforms for different types of um, organisation. Just to give you a, a sense of the how, how it can be extended, um, another part of my remit is to is to make partnerships with the professions, the professional bodies, the institutes and the Royal Societies and the membership associations. And there the platform, we think, is um, about a process of of showing them some of the research that we do, um, giving them a little bit more insight and 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 talking them through how they can apply that in their own um, professions in their own sector. So going a little bit beyond what we would normally do in, in sort of expecting people to know um, what, the, what the research can do for them and coming to us and asking for something specific. Here we're going to them and saying let's work through this research together and see how it fits with you. It, it, it's a very different set of uh, um, challenges but it, it, in our minds it's creating that platform. It's it's let's go to UCL because they're doing this interesting way of of thinking about our problems. So that's broadly how we um, kind of framed it. So um, so some of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, so these again, I preface this by these these may not work um, for everybody, and and for some they may already. Being, being being done. In fact, I suspect many of you will be doing this. I don't claim that UCL is anywhere near the head of the pack on this, but just um, in case some of this uh, resonates, um, we thought it was really important for the local authority and any partner that we work with to know what they want uh, from us. That's easy to say, um, but um, the idea of the glimpse model is very much about, about going a little bit further uh, and explaining what our research might mean for people um, working in a different sector. So I think the the model very much in the past has been you perhaps make a connection with the university, you go and have uh, an interesting discussion with an academic, and then the follow up is is the academic sending you a PDF of their latest piece of research. Um, you don't have time to read it. Um, it's probably difficult to understand anyway because it's written in academic language and the discussion stops there. So I think what we've realised is that it's our responsibility to make, to help people understand and to work with them to understand what the, our research might be able to do. Uh, so just to give you an example on that, you know, uh, the use of artificial intelligence, you know, quite honestly, we don't know really how well that might work in local authorities, what its potential is. We can see people using it already. Um, so the goal for us is to kind of work with Camden to understand what they might want to use that technology for and then put the challenge on us to say, well, can you do that? So um, I think it's really important. One of the most successful areas of that, I think, uh, was um, not really anything that we did, but Camden set up um, within internally. It's uh, an innovation network within the, the council, which is doing a great job of filtering um, requests or inquiries, thoughts that university might be able to do, uh, attesting those um, and uh, and basically coming up with with refined challenges for us, which is very, very helpful. Uh, I think one of the big challenges is is um, is getting the research question in a format that our academics can work with and can understand. Um, and there'll be other ways of doing that. Um, the walk together bit um, is uh, was actually a breakthrough for UCL. I suspect a lot of you are already doing this with your universities. Um, but our relationship with Camden two years ago was very transactional. They'll, they, they would have a, a question, they would find an academic, um, and then they would go off and do something together. Um, 
what I've tried to do and what the MOU, which we'll talk about in a minute, is trying to do is um, um, try to learn each other's strategic intent and to walk together down that pathway. The example I, I give, and Noel will forgive me, I hope, um, is getting very early on when I started UCL a call from somebody at Camden, did we have uh, an expert in high rise windows? Um, and it turns out, yes, we do. Um, uh, could he be in court or in a meeting the following day? Uh, no, because he was in uh, Peru or somewhere at the time. But had we known that there was a question about um, or a refurb of a high rise building taking place, um, were we kind of um, involved you know, on the periphery of some of those discussions, we could have perhaps anticipated that something like this might have happened and made it made allowance for it. So the idea of of walking together is is to kind of know where we're going and, and, and not have everything be response mode, because frankly, universities are terrible at response mode stuff. Communicate better. I think this is a, an obvious one, um, and that's why I put it in there so often. You know, more frequently, one of the things, the great things that has happened from from COVID is that we're we're meeting weekly now with count colleagues at Camden, and that has been fantastic, and it's generated all sorts of understanding, but also um, opportunities, um, and and also at all levels and that which brings me on to the next point which i think is you know get leaders on board uh, i was very lucky to be able to have a um, foreseeing boss in our in our in our uh, vice provost for innovation and enterprise who got that we needed to change the way that we were thinking about this and be more um, supportive and uh, a long-term partner and, and was very good at, at persuading other parts of the university um, to, to get on board with that. But also don't forget everybody else in the equation because it's not going to work if it's just a leadership. It is a holistic uh, thing that you've got to try and create. Um, start small but be still be strategic. So there's no shame, um, in my view, of of um, doing something a little and just testing it, developing things like trust, do, uh, things like um, uh, understanding, mutual understanding of where people are coming, understanding of how how problems are progressed in the different organisations. They're done differently. The language used is different. Um, the power plays are different. So um, no shame in doing that. And, and uh, with UCL, we tested the waters with um, Camden with a letter of intent, which was simply a letter saying, hey, let's do some stuff together. And we picked two areas um, we, and we've worked together quite well on 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 one of those areas. So um, but it, it paved the way and it showed us that uh, a strategic agreement could be um, could be put in place and could be advantageous. Um, advantageous. And um, I'm being flippant at the end, but uh, it's um, it, it cannot be avoided to say that the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has engendered a great deal of cooperation and communication and working together. I think that we have somewhere north of um, 15 discrete projects that have started in the last 10 months, um, often very little things, but that, that we're working together on, um, which I think is which I think is fantastic. And certainly at UCL, we're trying to think of ways in which we can perpetuate the sense of crisis without having actually COVID. So can you do rapid innovation in, in other ways? And we've got thoughts about that. So I've whittled on about the theory quite a lot. Um, so here are just um, a couple of a couple of examples. Um, and as I said, I'm very happy to talk more offline with anybody. Um, the the first is something that, that stems from COVID since we've been talking about it. Um, uh, we call it the, the rapid evaluation and learning service. So in the first call that I made to Noel um, shortly after March the 23rd, um, I, we, we were in a difficult position because I knew that most of my academic staff were not 
really able to do much because they were desperately trying to um, figure out how they were going to do exams, how they were going to move the rest of their teaching online, how we were going to close the university down. Um, so I was saying to Noel, I'm, I, you know, I'd like we'd like to help, but I'm not sure we can do it now. And Noel's response was was um, kind of music to my ears, um, which was actually we we that we're already past that. We're already doing what we need to do. What we're going to have is um, some interesting needs further down the line, two, three months down the line, as we redesign, re-engineer uh, a lot of our services um, re very rapidly, we'll need to e evaluate them. Um, and w as we come out of this, at that time we were expecting it not to be as, as long as it, as it has been, um, we'll almost certainly have a shortage of that, that, that knowledge and understanding internally. So what we did is um, set up a, a, a pro bono service which supplies or connects uh, use, um, Camden colleagues who are thinking about the evaluation and how to how to do it of a different service, connects them with um, a group of uh, one of a group of volunteer, uh, both professional services and academic staff. We now have, I think, about 11. Um, to give them some information, advice and guidance on how to do it. So they don't do the evaluation itself. We haven't been able to get to that, that point, but they're able to, to uh, help uh, our co colleagues in Camden frame how the evaluation should go, what might be the best approach and things to think about. Um, and as the time of writing, I think we've had about 13 cases of that going through, through the system. We've just extended it now to the end of the year. Um, and they include evaluations on adult social care, um, finance, family support. I mean, across the whole the whole area, um, and it's been great. And and I think it's it is an example of we feel we feel brilliant being able to offer it. I'm hoping it's providing really useful um, support to our colleagues at, at Camden. And then the MOU, which I've been alluding to. Um, so it's. It, 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 as I said, it's an attempt to create that treehouse. Um, the nice thing about the, the, the MOU is it, it allows us to, to agree a, uh, a, a common uh, agenda, um, which is what it does. It's not it's non-binding, which makes the legal people at UCL anyway, or any rate quite happy. Um, but the process of putting it together has actually been really, really helpful to us as we've looked at how how much we've actually got in in common and i think it has three elements um for us that uh, are, are are critical these the principles for for working together um i'll just read them out to you because they're they're i think they're great um it's that we'll share knowledge and build relationships together we'll mobilize people around missions to tackle issues important to camden's communities We'll provide opportunities and build the infrastructure for people to work together. That's really important, the plumbing. Um, we'll look for opportunities to extend our partnership to others where, where this supports our, our mutual vision. Um, and we'll make sure at all times that the work and the strategic partnership is making a difference to the residents of, 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 of Camden, not to us, not, not necessarily to Camden, it's um, Borough Council. So it, it encapsulates, it may seem, those may seem simple words, but for UCL, the, the, the idea that um, we're going to be listening, listening and acting to others is, is actually quite a profound change. Universities, I think, in common, uh, in general, have thought that they create knowledge uh, and then it's, it's for other people to use that. Um, and so we're doing two things, I think, which is which is really good, which is one is trying to go the extra mile and explain and work through in many cases ourselves how that knowledge might be applied and and be we're, we're listening. Um, we're taking our lead from Camden, not the other way around. The joint elements of working, I think, will will vary, you know, depending on on. Um, what institution you are, and if you're in a, if you're a, if you have a civil university uh, agreement, you'll you'll have different um, versions of all, of all of this. Um, I won't go through all of ours, but um, we're we're looking at things like um, can we make 
student placements more efficient between ourselves and the council. So they, they go on, they happen, they've been going on for ages, but more or less, if you want to get one going, you have to invent it anew each time. So, you know, can we try and coordinate that? And to just do that one thing will be will make a tremendous benefit because more students working in when with Camden gives them understanding of Camden. There's career opportunities there for them, but they also bring back an understanding of what the challenges are in other parts of the communities, which is really, really important. Um, staff exchanges. Uh, we, we're talking about a series of um, dialogues between uh, leaders of different um, services across 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 both organisations. So, uh, wouldn't it be interesting if our two comms uh, head of, head of comms people, you know, had a, had a bit of an understanding of how things go at the moment? We tend to kind of work around each other. Um, and then there are a series of um, very granular uh, challenges, climate emergency, fair funding, uh, inequality or equity, homelessness that we want to to focus on in particular. And, and those are those are areas chosen because UCL has has good research strength in those. And we ought to be able to to apply that that well. And that Camden has targeted those areas in its strategic um, plan as as areas that it wants to ad address. And then finally, uh, just the government's, again, a breakthrough for us to have this be a joint uh, governance arrangement. We are even talking about, um, I say even, shouldn't be, but you know, a joint post should be really a, a bit of a no brainer for something like this. Um, and we are, but and we're not there yet, but it's, it's that kind of work that I think will um, make the transaction of ideas and challenges between our institutions become almost seamless, which is where we where we want to be um, at the at the end of it. Um, there are many other areas that we're working on, and we've done some really interesting things, some social challenge uh, hacks that we've done with Camden. Um, we're working on Black Lives Matters. We're working on contract tracing. Um, lots of different areas. So I, what I've tried to do here is is talk you through the thinking and the change that we as an institution and, and perhaps me as a person has, has gone through um, in the last two years to move us from being a sort of slightly didactic relationship to which was which was sort of seemed to be coming from UCL to being um, one where UCL is listening. It's a it's a genuine two way partnership. And we hope to sign our MOU uh, later this month. And then I'm, I'm just thrilled to see where that's going to take us in the future. So um, with that, Noel, I'm going to hand back to you on that. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And, and, and thanks for that uh, kind of very, very personal take on the kind of on, 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 the, on the relationship between UCL and, and Camden and as uh, someone who's uh, been working with you um, on this from um, kind of the, the, the council perspective, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always really important with, with any organisation, not least as kind of complex and uh, multi-layered as, as UCL and, you know, and as councils, we are, you know, we are as well to kind of to, 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 to build those strong strong relationships and then actually turn them into visible impact and they're kind of the the example you you gave about the um the rapid evaluation service is a you know is a really great example of something that we're able to um kind of scale up you know within within the matter of weeks and i, I think that's that's down to kind of to the relationships and to both organizations not just thinking strategically but like you know putting putting that into practice um, and when we kind of get into kind of the the, the, the breakouts, one of the one of the questions um, will be about you know kind of the you know universities have have different roles you know whether that's as researchers or policy advisors or um, suppliers of services or, or or strategists you know kind of what role should they play and we've you know we've um, I think 
we, we picked a particular focus on the kind of the green green economy um, as an example. Um, but I think kind of your um, your presentation, uh, Michael, has kind of re really really shown kind of one that one the complexity and diversity, but then how you how you can kind of cut through that to to, to make things happen in a strategic way. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move out of uh, and of Camden, and we're gonna move we're gonna move south to uh, South Kensington. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome Nicholas uh, from the kind of the, the the Royal Royal College of Arts, um, who I've worked with um, as uh, as uh, as well, um, which is you know kind of a, a, a world class um, arts and um, design design institution and kind of you know, have a look on their website in terms of the people that have graduated there that are very famous I won't go through their names uh, but it's also great to see um, the RCA's commitment to, um, to to public services and to uh, and to social innovation and I know through, through working with them how they've been able to kind of stretch our thinking and also and also our practice as well so I won't I won't say any more because um, Nicholas will be able to Kind of talk talk you through the work. Um, over to you, Nicholas. Great. Well, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, this... Here it is. I excuse myself because I don't use Teams, but there. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see that. Yes. If any, if everyone else can, do shout. Yeah. Great. So, uh, well, thank you for having me, Noel, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that I could be here. And at the presentation I, I created, basically, first, it's all about explaining who, who we are and what we do, because it's uh, when we say service design is kind of an emerging practice that is difficult to to perhaps to, to, to understand. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, first, I'm going to just walk you through what, what is the RCA, then what do we do in service design and then if you have some time, some cases, I have some videos, but it seems that the audio is not working, but I can send you the the links uh, later. Perhaps to, to introduce myself, I, I'm uh, Nicolás Raguelo. I'm, um, I'm from Chile, based in London, almost 10 years now. I'm an architect by background, um, and my, my, my expertise is in using design for public sector innovation and social innovation. I have a PhD uh, in at the RCA and also um, an MA at UCL in technology entrepreneurship. So it's all about combining public sector innovation with, a, with an entrepreneurial approach towards innovation. So the RCA, I was, Noel was saying, is a very old university, 180 years, founded uh, in 1837. But uh, for the past five or six years, is the uh, number one uh, art and design uh, school in, in the world. We have three, three campuses. But I think what is interesting for the talk, uh, and I think for me this was really important when I when I joined the RCA, is that it was founded back back then in 19th century, and this is uh, Hyde Park, with the with the Paxton uh, Crystal Palace thing, and it was founded as a basically as um as an institute, the Institute of Design, to combine uh, craftsmanship and art with the technological improvements, I would say, of the first and second industrial revolution. So the definition of art in this case is more around the human capacity to connect lifestyle and people with uh, technology and science innovation. And I think that has been at the RCA core for a long time, uh, just from the beginning. So starting from, from this, uh, from this uh, uh, exhibition into, some of you might know, the Festival of Britain after, after the war, again using design to connect uh, the industrial developments and uh, and the, and the future thinking of Britain with the with people and, and lifestyle or and this uh, is very uh, important to us and particularly in in, in, in design research uh, during the second half of the 20th century the design research units the, who did work such as uh, designing the bed of the NHS, or, or the brand of British Rail or, or the Victoria Line, for example, uh, using design uh, at the service of, of public problems uh, and creating, I would say, that uh, environment with, 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 where, where people live and services that people that people use. And also just a, 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 an example of another graduate of the RCA, uh, the designer of the London bus, Thomas Heatherwick, on the, on the early 
2010s. Um, now the, the RCA, uh, the, the School of Design, combines almost 10 programs, products, fashion, and others, and service design. Um, basically, uh, what we say is that we combine creativity, business, and, and technology, and going to go through through that now. So for from redesigning, I would say, musical instruments and products such as Seaboard, that is a product, these are products from students that then become, become uh, companies, or, or the last one that I really like, Petit Plea from, uh, from Brian, that is basically uh, clothing for, for babies uh, to tackle, I would say, the, the waste in, in, in fashion. Or projects like uh, this one, this is Luwat from Virginia Garden in, in 2012, that is basically a toilet without, without water, uh, basically to be installed in places that they don't have access to water. Or projects uh, that we're doing now with uh, with, with with some uh, councils and other organizations has good talk. This was a project of 2019 that basically it's a it's a platform that connects uh, volunteers with young people in to, to give uh, peer to peer support on mental health. This project was done by with uh, with Bernardo's um, charity. Or oh, this one in house record that is another uh, project that we did in a in a program from Judah Armani in 2018 is basically a record label uh, for uh, inmates and it's installed uh, it's 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 uh, it's up and running in more than four prisons around around the UK or this one that was my my personal project that uh, was to create a government innovation laboratory in Chile this is my country for the Chilean government using design to tackle tackle public problems. So when we say design, and, and forgive me just a little bit of theory, but I think it's important, is that we mean not necessarily styling and not necessarily art in the sense of expression, but we mean basically three things. So design as a, as a change process and, uh, and, and, and this idea that everyone designs, not just designers, when we want to plan or create courses of action of change in existing situations. So there's a lot about innovation in that sense. The second thing is that it's a, it's a creative process, so it's creativity with purpose. Uh, so we use design to basically shape ideas to become practical propositions for users and customers. And finally, this future orientation of design as an exploration um, to imagine and to explore future ways of, of living. So taking this into consideration, what we do in service design, and uh, perhaps some of you are, are familiar with that, is that we are all focusing on how we could create how we could use this creativity at the purpose of creating some sort of value in that sense so we do it articulating three things so the first is is to understand people and what's needed and desirable and then try to connect that with what's feasible what technologies are out there and then what is viable uh, for the organization and this is a, is the basic triangle of, of design thinking that is known but we are trying to use this uh, at the service of public organizations as well. So our agenda of design is a lot to do with basically try to explore new forms of value, of value creation and value delivery, starting with the new desires, challenges and needs. And this is, I would say, our agenda on design. Uh, so ba basically uh, based on the big social cultural shifts, uh, aging population, global warming, inequality, the green economy, the things that uh, that we've been discussing, I think, uh, some of the things we've been discussing this morning. So what are the new needs and what are the new uh, uh, the new challenges from a human perspective? But the, the in, our interest is how we could combine that with the possibilities enabled by new technologies. And that's why we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, even well, Hillary Cotton talk about the fifth one. But anyway, it's all about this new digitaliz digitalization of the world. Um, so it's all about how we could focus on these big social cultural shifts by taking advantage of the new possibilities enabled by technology. And finally, what are the new logics of value creation in the context of what we call the platform economy, basically platform networks, ecosystems. And, uh, and basically today's not just about the value on things, it's more about the value on interactions and experiences and how we exploit uh, uh, assets in a coordinated manner. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but I think this is important for, to establish why are we working, why, why for us it's so important to work with public organizations, basically, uh, because we believe that most of these challenges, not all of them, but most of them 
um, the public sector has a, a, a role a role to play. So the way we do it is that we have a strong partnership uh, there in South Kensington with Imperial College. So basically we, we have a combination of program is a mixed program between the RCA itself, the School of Design, but also with the Imperial Business School and with Imperial Computing and also with other business schools. We have a partnership with, with, with the London Business School as well, trying to understand the, this, what I was saying about the the platform economy and with Imperial Computing try to leverage new digital technologies and we work in close collaboration with industry so from big uh, companies private companies with other organizations such as festival as well but also my role in particular that I lead this policy platform we work with um, central government organizations and also uh, city councils and um, and we've been doing this for the past um, I would say seven, seven years. And what we try to do with all of these partners and trying again to put the focus on this on this triad is that we put in place creative and strategic process that can combine the question that the organization have, what is needed, what is desired and what's the problem worth dealing with. And that case similar with what was been said before, we start from a brief of what a very clear, not necessarily clear, but a, with a very strong need or challenge put in place by the organization, then try to connect that with, with the state of the art of new technologies and resources, and also how we could leverage the resources of the exi existing in the organization, and then uh, try to put that at the service of the impact that the organization is looking for, uh, connecting that with capabilities also, but also with the, the legitimacy and the position of the, that organization. Basically, some just general thoughts. We try all the time to focus uh, on users, the culture uh, and behavior using uh, ethnographic techniques. These are some examples of our, these are real pictures of, of, of our own um, research. But not just uh, users as, uh, as subjects um, of, uh, of, of, of the services, but also as agents of, of change. And uh, we uh, put in place a lot of, of what we call co-creation uh, techniques. This, uh, this is an example of a, uh, a recent project that we did, not a recent, but a project that we did with a um, Danish hospital. Um, uh, and uh, it's all about co-creating with doctors and nurses in this case. This is also from there. Uh, understand the problem from, a, from, a, from, the con from the perspective of the actor networks. In this project that we were doing with the um, uh, New Zealand hospital, in Denmark, we were looking at a vision on telemedicine, and it's all about co-creating with uh, with uh, doctors, nurses, and others, and put their roles in the context of, uh, I would say, the intelligence architecture of 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 telemedicine. That is this thing, but also using uh, experimental entrepreneurship techniques as a form of prototypes. And so, this is another project that we did with Telefonica Alpha, uh, looking at uh, AI and health. And we do a lot of, I would say, digital prototyping, what we call pitch MVPs, so landing page ads, surveys, little digital experiments, but also user testing, uh, working with people and, and user experiments, basically trying to recruit people to, 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 to use our services. We do this, and perhaps this is more concrete, in the context of, um, of a studio format. So our, um, our program is two years. So we have a first year that is the foundation. We have three. If you see what is in blue are all the projects that our students uh, do. So we uh, we basically connect with the industry and, and partners in term two and three. So show projects around 12 weeks. Then internships more. Many of our students go into internships in uh, in private sector. The, the, the thing on public sector is growing now. We have interest in at the MOJ at the policy lab. And now we're opening um, something on the Department of Education. And then term four and five is uh, a year, a whole year that we put in place. And uh, I would say the capstone projects, that's not the name that we use, but I, I think that's other universities use to, to use that name. Uh, we tried that to do it in connection with, with partnerships. And we have three kind of projects, I would say. I did the slides for today because various formats. So one kind of projects that we do are, are what we call speculative projects. So in the case that is there is uh, Becky Miller. Becky is now is working at the Policy Lab, uh, but Becky did a project uh, that won the Future of Money Design Award that she speculated and created a tax 
uh, a new tax for for things basically a tax uh, what she called the planet impact tax and when we say speculative design is about these visions of future services what if we were to create this kind of tax station uh, connected with the with the planet impact that products have what might happen and uh, so those projects are more in the in the art creative uh, critical thinking area and i think that's growing at the rca a lot so use use design to create provocations and then discussions about things then what is in the middle is uh, at least what what i'm most involved in is that we create startups i would say uh, startups that are uh, socially driven or privately driven, as the one I show you about the the loo and in-house records that I'm going to show in a minute. Uh, and this is what the what Judah did, did that is now implemented in prisons. And then we do, uh, and this is also growing. The startup is kind of contact, we a constant. We have two or three students every year that wants to go and do their own thing uh, with partnerships, uh, with with establishing partnership with other organizations. But what is growing a lot, and I think perhaps it's for the the generations of our students is that we set up projects with established organizations and and the one that uh, for example in this case Charlotte Fontaine she's working now in Public Health England um, and she started her final project was to work with Medicine Sound Frontiers uh, with with doctors in particular designing a very specific touch point that was the handover process between uh, the missions of the doctors that goes to different countries. So if a doctor goes there and has a, a, a time of six to one year time, and then the handover process for the new doctor to arrive. So very, very specific, I would say, touch point and challenges inside organizations. And I think that that is growing. A lot of our students that have this uh, very social, so they're, they're very socially driven. Uh, they use this project to to explore a field and then uh, move and find a job, I think, in the area, in the case of, of Charlotte, that she's now working in public health in uh, England. So if I have, yeah, I have five minutes, uh, some cases, I hope this 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 works. The in-house record that I was just telling you, I'm gonna, I, I want to show you a video of what this is. That is a record label inside prisons, created in, in conjunction with the, with the inmates which seeks to enhance the musical talent of the participants and offer them new opportunities for professional development. Uh, and the whole point is to reintegrate them into society and stop uh, reoffending and violence. I'm going to show a video that is just a, kind of an, an ad of this. Our prisons have high levels of violence and low numbers of prisoners learning work skills. We have a super high reoffending rate and we've doubled the number of prisoners in our prison since 1995. Violence and unemployment in prison are higher than they have ever been in the last 100 years. And the cost of the UK government is around £15 billion per year. It's a complex story. Something had to change. Sometimes the simplest things can make a difference to the big problems. Like a record label. In-house records is a record label launched in prison and run by prisoners. It's the first of its kind in the UK. And possibly the world. It's a label for change, helping prisoners learn new skills and repurposing old ones. And giving us the opportunities to show that, in time, with support, people can change. Our music does not seek to glorify criminal lifestyle or negative behaviour. The prisoners give up privileges in order to work hard on making the label successful. Which is especially difficult in such a competitive arena as the music industry. Proceeds from our sales are donated to victim support. In house records is a label that is making a difference to a big problem. Benefiting our neighbourhoods, creating safer communities, and fewer victims of crime. We are making huge positive impacts in the prisons we operate in, and we're making a real difference on the outside too. Reducing reoffending and creating job opportunities. In house records is more than just a record label. Our vision is to see safer communities, fewer victims of crime. And people leave in prison with skills that will prevent reoffending and secure work with dignity. What we have achieved so far is truly amazing, but to go further, we need your support. From following us on Instagram, to supporting our ethical and sustainable apparel from our online shop. You can also give to our preventative work on the outside. This work takes place in our own unique and innovative record shop hub. Dangerously, 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 dangerously positive. We are in-house records. What is interesting of this of this uh, of this project, I think, is that uh, it starts from a public problem. Uh, this this uh, violence and unemployment and, uh, and key facts 
key policy facts, I would say, in terms of, of making this relevant. I think it's important to say that this also started by the connections that we have with MOJ, uh, with the Ministry of Justice, we've been working almost for 10 years. And one, the, the founder, the, our student Judah, he uh, was working already with prison industries. So that connection was already in place. And um, because of his connection with prison industries, uh, Judah has this, uh, this, this key hypothesis, I would say, that uh, he spot that inmates have talent, basically, and they were kind of savvy in terms of management uh, stuff, but also saw that music was, was a door. And he's already had the connection with the music industry. I think it's important to say that the work that Judah was doing already with prisons was in prison industries creating merchandising for Fender, for example. So the job was all about creating creating little sub hand jobs. And he saw the opportunity with the support of, 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 uh, of MOJ, basically to leverage or to create a new kind of work environment for the inmates. And, uh, and the challenge was how, how we might foster existing talent of inmates and leverage the networks that uh, we have in the music industry to reduce violence and reoffending rates. And I think that's also interesting if you saw in the in the video, it was not the connection between uh, RCA, Judah and, and the MOJ, but also with other private partners, in this case EY and EY Ventures, that basically uh, supported the project with the venture capital to start uh, to, to start actually the project. So the theory of change is that this will basically, if we create this uh, record label, this could potentially drive job creation and reintegration basically uh, through skills. And uh, and this has been the metric so far. So uh, a big increase in positive behavior and uh, a big increase in the commitment and participation of, of prisoners. I'm not going to go into the other into the other case, but I will send you that, that link. Um, but I think I just wanted to finish with some um, with some challenges. I think we've learned that there's a need for emerging practices to tackle public problems in, in most of our partners. And I think a demonstration of that has been most more than 30, 40 projects that we've done in the past six years. Students and staff, uh, as, as, as me that I used to be as students as well, we are committed with the new challenges, but in this case, from a practical perspective, in this very brief uh, talk, that our approach, even though that we are a university and we are an academic institution, our approach is really concrete and practical, and I think that's the art element uh, of it. And I think from our partners, there's a very clear value. They see the value in the mindset and the skills and, and the delivery that we have. But some of the challenges that we still have is that there's some mix between skills, experience and implementation that all the time we need to choose when we work with partners. What is the main what is the main focus? Uh, particularly, I think that's uh, in my view from working with councils, the challenge with working with councils has is this idea of of the imperative of implementation uh, that councils have uh, in contracts with the with the challenge of creating new new skills, nurturing new skills, but also creating perhaps from new, more uh, futuristic visions of things. Uh, and I think this is the second challenge: the balance between these visions and the concrete delivery uh, that we could that we can bring to the table. For the students, is the challenge of access and accessibility. I think projects at work when they have and they really can connect with the key stakeholders and, and users. And I think the model of partnerships, we're still working on that. As you saw very briefly, we have different models and it depends on the organization. So from a futuristic visions and the whole idea of sponsoring, I would say speculative projects from uh, giving access and, uh, and creating and supporting startups from uh, um, and um, offering concrete opportunities to develop projects as the Medicine Sun Frontiers example. Um, however, uh, we are open for experimenting. So I think we still are in the process of exploring what's the best uh, model, and uh, and I think we yeah we're really willing to work with with all of you. So thank you. This is our Instagram, and here's my details.